Many of you are friends of Kelly's, it appears. Um, so this information may not be new to you, um, but it's my pleasure to introduce you, Kelly. Um, Kelly is an award-winning writer and teacher from the Metro Detroit area. Her latest short story collection, I Have the Answer, published by Wayne State University Press in 2020, was chosen as a Midwest Book Award finalist and an Eric Hoffer finalist. This is a wonderful collection in which the ordinary and extraordinary intermingle seamlessly, and the characters and relationships are deeply human and deftly crafted. I found myself thinking about them long after I closed the book. In her 2016 Michigan notable book, Garden for the Blind, is a book of linked short stories. I first came to enjoy and appreciate this approach when I read Elizabeth Strout's Olive Kitteridge. I loved Kelly's Alice Towsley, whose life and times are richly drawn along with other well-realized characters who touch Alice's life and whom I came to care about, even if they appeared only briefly. Garden for the Blind was an Indie Fab finalist, a Midwest Book Award finalist, an Eric Hoffer finalist, and an Ippy Award bronze medalist. Kelly Forden's first full-length poetry collection, Goodbye Toothless House, was published by Caddy Wampus Press in 2019. It was an Islands International Prize finalist and an Eric Hoffer finalist. It was also adapted into a play by Robin Martin, which was published in the Kenyon Review Online. Reviewers of the collection call the writing unflinching, bold, sharply insightful, and a sustained indictment of a culture that forces women into limited roles. Ms. Forden is also the author of three award-winning poetry chapbooks. She has received the Best of the Net Award, as well as Pushcart Prize nominations in three different genres. She teaches at Springfed Arts and the Inside Out Literary Arts Project in Detroit, as well as online. Kelly runs a monthly online poetry and fiction blog at www.kellyforden.com. Please welcome Kelly Forden. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was such a nice introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you so much, um, David and Ed and everyone um, for having me. And I think I'll do a couple different things. I wanted to share like five minutes of this story. So one, um, one of maybe the only good things that happened during the pandemic was my friend Robin who lives in New York and she's a writer. She knew all these actors who were out of work. So um, she got a couple of them to record like five minutes of my story. A couple of them did a whole story, um, but this one great actor um, that she knew did five minutes of this story. So I thought it would be kind of fun to show you. And then I put, I have pictures with it. You'll, <laughs> you'll notice sort of my amateurish pictures, but I think it's kind of fun to hear him. So hopefully this, I'll be able to share this. Um, can everybody see this right now? What I have up, can you see I have the answer, the book? Yes. Up there, yes. okay. So I'll just turn it on to the slideshow. Um, so that's the, the um, cover of the book that just came out in 2020, right in time, right in the beginning of the pandemic, <laughs> which was good timing. Um, but no, I'm kidding. But um, so that was my other book, Garden for the Blind. And then I just wanted to give a shout out to the Made in Michigan Writer Series, because I think you probably, you guys probably all know of it. But since you're all, most of you are writers, I've had just a wonderful time publishing with them, and I highly recommend them. Um, they publish poetry, creative nonfiction, short fiction, um, and Annie Martin's the editor in chief, and she was wonderful to work with. So um, send your work there for sure. That's uh, my poetry collection. Okay, so this story is called um, Superman at Hogback Ridge. And it's a story, basically it's about a man who's taking his 15 year old son fishing uh, when his car breaks down and he encounters something unexpected. And in the story, so when I'm writing, I don't know, I think a couple of people write fiction and poetry, but for me, 
when I'm writing fiction, I'm just trying to figure out relationships, right? So sometimes I'll have like a difficult relationship. And so I'll create these characters who can, you know, walk their way through a similar relationship. And then maybe my goal is always to get to a point of redemption so that I feel better, <laughs> so that I feel better or that so that I understand the other person more. And um, I mean, people talk about that all the time, how it's like an opportunity to increase your empathy. And it, and it really has been for me. So um, anyway, so in this story, this guy, his son is not talking to him because he's 15 years old. And he says, I'm going to take him on this fishing, fishing trip. So this is like the first maybe three or four minutes here. I called my wife, Terry, to tell her the car had conked out on the road to Hogback Ridge. Serves you right, she said. Then she hung up on me. It sounds harsh, but she had a point. I should have given up on this clunker long ago. My Volvo 240 is nearly 15 years old, and I'd have been trying to hold on until I hit the 300 mile mark. I'd replaced the fuel pump the week before, but clearly that wasn't the problem. Suddenly on Route 307, the car was refusing to go faster than 10 miles per hour. Not good to coast to a stop on a rural road out by Hogback Ridge State Park, but better than zeroing out in the middle of the highway, I figured. Terry just bought a new car for herself, and I admit I was holding it against her, refusing to replace mine because she'd acted so imprudently. The Lexus was way beyond our means, especially if we planned to retire in seven years, as we had discussed ad infinitum. My son, David, 15, was beside me in the passenger seat, earbuds in 24-7. Let's just say... He was there, but not there. This fishing trip was a means of luring him back, no pun intended. When he was younger, Hogback Ridge had always been one of our favorite destinations. 414 acres bordered on the north by the Grand River and the south by Mill Creek. The Grand is home to more than 70 species of fish. Plus, the river is bounded on one side by a high, narrow ridge, which in the winter clearly resembles the bony spine of a hog. And in the early spring, when the steelhead are running, is overlaid with delicate white bloodroot and spring beauty flowers. I decided to try to coast downhill into the parking lot. Because of a slight decline, we were cruising at a cool 10 miles per hour when I looked in the rear view mirror and saw a black pickup truck barreling down the road at 80 to 90 miles an hour. I turned my wheel toward the side of the road and the entrance to the long abandoned Thunder Bay golf course though there was no way I could make it out of his way in time. My only hope was that he would see me and slam on the brakes, which he did. He came to a stop about two feet before impact. Before I could even release my grip on the wheel, he screeched out into the other lane and pulled up alongside me. I rolled down the window. Fuck you, Grandpa, what the fuck? What the fuck you doing sitting in the fucking road? The driver was a teenager with light blue, red-ribbed eyes, a shaved head, a nose ring, and earrings that ran like ladder rungs up and down his earlobes. He scowled at me, and I noticed his right front incisor was missing and the rest of his teeth were dung brown. The person in the passenger seat leaned forward, a pasty young girl with a nose ring whose hair was concealed by a white ski hat with a pink pom-pom. You fucking loser, she yelled. Why don't you learn to drive? Get the fuck out of the road! I glanced over at David. He was staring at them, but his earbuds were still in. I hoped he couldn't hear them through his music. I turned away without responding. It's not wise to interact with insane people. I have a button under my desk at the bank that I've used twice to defuse situations, much like this one. My son might be a recalcitrant, but at least he's not a skinhead, I thought. If parents don't occasionally pad the pros and ignore the cons, this job can seem pretty thankless. At least David wasn't as openly hostile to me as he was to Terry. She's a high school principal, so you might assume that no surly teen could flummox her. But nothing could be further from the truth. The strain of David was nearly killing her. In fact, I think it was worse for her, because kids at her school were always confiding in her, telling her she was so much more understanding than their parents. Since David was now effectively mute three of us spent most of our evenings sealed off in separate rooms. Me in my upstairs office, 
Terry in the TV room competing in the Netflix Olympics, and David down in the basement gaming. After the skinhead had doused me with vitriol one last time, he rolled up his window and peeled out ahead of us. Thank God that's over, I thought, and I started to loosen my grip on the wheel. But then a few yards down the road, he must have decided that he had more to say because he stopped again, got out of his car, and started marching down the middle of the road toward me. He was at least six feet tall, skinny, pale as shaved ice, combat boots, tattoos covering every inch of skin right up to his neck. What about it, old man? He said. Did you think I wanted to fight? While he stared down at me with his roomy blue eyes, his arms jerked up and down like a marionette who was being yanked around by a sadistic puppeteer. Okay. So I thought that was kind of fun <clears throat> to have someone else read a little bit of that. Um, okay, and now I'm back. Um, so that's kind of a cool thing to know about. There are a lot of um, actors out there who are willing to read. Um, and it's kind of fun, I think, for people as well. I just want to make sure I can see some people here. Um, you know, to hear someone else read your work is kind of a fun experience. So, um, so if anyone ever wants, I have the names of all these people and I can give you some names if you want someone to read. Um, so I thought I would talk a little bit like about obsession uh, and show some examples of how it plays out in my writing. Um, so I am currently working on a book uh, called The Congressman's Daughter or House in Ohio because I grew up the daughter of a conservative Republican <laughs> congressman. It's like hard for me to say it. <laughs> But I did, and um, <clears throat> so I've been grappling with that material for a long time. And also growing up very strict Catholic um, in a very strict Catholic household. So I've written about it again and again, but I think it's kind of fun to show other writers how I think the material just keeps offering more. Um, I keep thinking I'm done with it and then it keeps coming up. So I'll just share a couple pages of this story and it starts out with, um, it's a novel, but it's loosely based on a lot of my experiences. So it starts out when the girl's very young. So this part is gonna read sort of like um, young adult, unfortunately, so, but um, it's just a few pages. So um, 1974, Kibby knows about the war and the fact that the president is a liar. Every night she hides by the potted plant outside the study while her parents watch the news. This is the way she has learned all about the world. Earlier this year, a college girl named Patty was abducted by an army clanging cymbals and a television presenter shot herself on live TV. An acrobat walked on a wire between two towers in New York. Her father and mother never say anything during the news. The only sound is the crinkling of her mother's newspaper. Smoke from her father's cigarette drifts out into the hall and sometimes Kibby buries her face in the ocean blue shag to stop the cough that will give her away. She would not be in the hallway at all, except she is too scared to sleep alone in her room. Her room has bright green walls on one side and bright pink walls on the other, walls that whisper and shimmer and pulse like a giant heartbeat. Under the bed, there are monsters and ogres and witches and just outside owls hoot and werewolves tap on her big bay window. If she touches the window, she will turn to stone. If she looks in the mirror, Bloody Mary will slit her throat. It is not possible to keep all of the bad guys out. Sometimes a hand reaches up through the toilet to pull her down into the bottomless pit. She'll fall straight through the world. Sometimes the fairy behind the toothbrush holder is nice and other times she sends a shock right up through the drain, which hits Kippy between the eyes and knocks her flat. If she scooches all the way down under the covers at night, she can protect herself from the tickle strangler but if she gets up and runs across the room, she only has three seconds to make it to the door before she gets sucked down into a mud pit, never to be seen again. Her mother says all of her nonsense fears are the work of the devil. You have to say, I love you, Jesus. I'm sorry for my sins. Thank you for everything. You have to say it a hundred times a day. At night, you have to say it over and over until you fall asleep. If you stop for even a minute, the devil will worm his way into your ears and teeter-totter on your wishbone. 
Her father says the devil is real, but it's not as bad as all that. He can only get you if you invite him over. One time there was a boy in Maryland who called to the devil through a Ouija board and the devil jumped right into the boy's body. I went to school with one of the priests who tried to get the devil out, but he just wouldn't leave, her father says. All spring, the priest told us stories about the boy, how the devil was scratching his arms and legs and writing messages on his chest. One time the devil even threw him across the room. A priest standing right next to the boy even got stabbed. They had to send the boy to St. Louis in the end and it took 16 priests to exercise the devil. Exercise the devil, meaning pull him out, her father says, pull him out of the boy's body. This is just like the shine, the shine some people have and the darkness on others, like a film. Some people look like they need a little elbow grease and an SOS pad, her, mother, her grandmother Mary says. What happened to the little boy, she says to her father. I guess he's fine now, married with kids. They're even going to make a movie about that exorcism. They say the movie is almost exactly what happened in real life, except that in the movie, the devil jumps into a little girl. That is not a story sh you should ever tell a young child, her mother says to her father later after many sleepless nights. Kibby is headed to Ohio to campaign. In Ohio, she sleeps up in the room at the top of the back stairs where the waves on Lake Erie sound like crazy people banging on the windows. During the campaign season, she must smile with teeth. She must wave and be nice or else. When the grownups are talking, she must listen like they've all descended from heaven on the clouds. She cannot interrupt. If she does all of these things, her father will be able to keep his job. I know you don't want your father to lose, her mother says. They are driving from Washington to Ohio in the big blue Ford LTD. Every time they make this trip, her father times it. And if everything goes well, he can make it in six hours and 11 minutes. The Pennsylvania Turnpike is like a ball of twine unwinding. The cars drive close together, so there are many accidents. When the weather is bad, you might just fly off the road and into the woods. One time there was a huge storm on the Pennsylvania Turnpike and they passed a terrible accident. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, her mother said when they drove by it, upset about it, but not enough to take the Lord's name in vain. As they passed by the hurt people on the side of the road, Kibby noticed a little boy in blue shorts and a white shirt with blood running down his leg. The boy kept saying, mommy, mommy, to a sheet draped across the road. As they got closer, Kibby saw that it wasn't a sheet, it was a coat with a lump under it. The boy looked right at her then. Mommy, he said to her, and Kibby looked away. That was a bad trip. That was an eight hour more trip. This time everything goes fine. The trees are like coloring book trees. The sky is blue enough to hurt your eyes. Her father lights another cigarette. Everyone on the radio keeps saying, why is he doing this? Why is he doing that? Even her mother says, why do you think he did that? And her father says, hard to say, I'm just glad he resigned so I didn't have to vote him out. Last time her father campaigned, she was in kindergarten and her parents let her stay home all day doing her lessons at the round table on the porch. But this time she will have to go to the local school for three weeks. When she asks why, her mother says, mostly so you won't get underfoot. And then kidding, I'm just kidding. Do you see that building there? That's the largest automobile plant in the world, her father says, pointing to a white building that goes on and on with more cars than Kibby has ever seen in her life. A large blue and white sign out front reads Lordstown. I love it when you say the whole world with such conviction, her mother says. It is, her father says. I think that might be a slight exaggeration, her mother says, and her father laughs. Might be, he says, but that's what my sources tell me. So, so that I just wanted to um, <laughs> give you a little sampling because um, a lot of the poems that I write are um, either about Catholicism or about, you know, growing up in that world, um, but are possibly like a little bit darker. <laughs> I was trying to get some humor into that. Mm -hmm. So um, my aunt was a, she led a youth group um, of Catholic school kids. And I was also one of the first altar girls in the seventies. So um, that was the era when Catholics, you know, like anything the priest said, when you were safe with the priest, you know, everybody. And so we were all, 
like alone with all these priests. And um, so my aunt told me the story of, go of taking these kids on a retreat and um, one of the priests there molested one of the kids and she had no idea. So she was like the leader, yeah. So that prompted me to write like a whole chat book called The Witness. Um, and then I later found out, and I'll read you this poem. So I just kept going, unfortunately, but um, I later found out that at my grade school, which is called Our Lady of Victory, a few years after I left, uh, another pedophile, pedophile priest showed up. So this poem is called Close Call at Our Lady of Victory, 1981. Then there was Foursquare, JP playing Dungeons and Dragons, all the girls in a clutch, turning double Dutch. On hot days, we wandered across MacArthur, followed the train tracks, slipped under the fence into the reservoir despite the eels. The days were long and filled with a heavenly light. We were nine years away from Tom Chlebowski. We still had Red Rover and the long climb up onto the roof of the church where we sang, I'm on top of the world and lucky we were to believe it. Thank you. Um, okay, so this one's called Washington DC. So that's why I wanted to start with the, <laughs> the fiction so you know where this is coming from. Washington DC, the magician's hat fails to produce anything but lint. The cherry blossoms sing arias in April. You can smell their insouescence. The Washington Monument, a rocket aimed at the night, an arrow pointing toward God, a cone filled with prayer beads, a rattle in the divine hand. In winter, I miss the cicadas and all the hot air. Most of my friends are lawyers, born of built beltway infighting, defending places they've never seen, situations that arise well beyond the sepulchral horizon. I first learned of love in DC, and what matters most to men, fence posts made from muskets, roads that circle but lead nowhere. Thank you. Okay. And then um, I started writing a bunch of poems about believers, like nothing against, you know, we all have our beliefs, but I was more thinking about how people are always so convinced, um, or at least in my world growing up, you know, like, I'm right, <laughs> I'm definitely right, you know? And so I, I write a bunch of poems about that. So this one's called Hard to Know. Do diamonds rain down on Jupiter and Saturn? Will a frog in the pitcher stave off sour milk? Is Jesus the ladder to heaven? Do angels hoist buckets of what? Maybe they water the grass? This morning, such a surreal green, and then the day shed her yellow coat. A Tom ambled past my plinth with his winter kill. Who needs a witness and her bitter tears? My mother believed my sins would be forgiven, but the priest had other plans. Most of the perpetrators keep rising regardless, clutching the rungs, squashing the innocent souls. It must be cold on that ladder, bone chilling. The gatekeeper fumbling, humanity like lint balls clinging to his robe all the zealots and jeremiads scrabbling up the folds. I can hear the faithful booing as I push these words out like slugs. Hand me another apple. Um, and so, because you can see this uh, paint job back here, <laughs> I'm gonna read this one called Riding Out the Pandemic in My Great Grandmother's Bedroom because this wasn't her bedroom, this was like the master bedroom. And then my great grandmother who used, who was an upstairs maid who came over from Ireland, she, she was actually in this house. But for some reason she took the back bedroom, like the, the back bedroom over the um, driveway with no view of the water or anything. She, she um, I don't know why she did that, but anyway, she would just sit up there with her rosary beads and, um, pray all the time. So riding out the pandemic in my great grandmother's bedroom. Outside the window, the clouds are in training, the trees bronchial but motionless. The sky is blue as preschool paint. There is no one on the street. The dog lolls, tongue like pavement. I bought a vlogging light and feel ashamed. 
I don't want to Zoom with anyone. I don't want to talk or critique stupid poems or write a stupid poem or read or wear the mask my friend made from scratch. Since when does she sew? And no, I'm not going to clean out the closet or paint the house. This bedroom window is so small. It's a wonder Delia survived here at all before missing the step, tumbling down the rest, past the call button on the wall with its incessant bleeding. If the owner wanted toast, he could order her right up, night or day. The red-handed, rosary-wielding upstairs maid, Delia, who lived here before me, who sailed over from Ireland, then lost her husband in a streetcar accident and her son to a kidney punch and her granddaughters and on and on. And I made it all these years until now with no obstruction, no tightness, no wilted grapes or secondhand shoes. Now I'm the owner of the house and I'm the one pressing the call button, the one alone in this tiny bedroom summoning Delia each night wondering if she would laugh at how quickly I've succumbed, or would she sing to me instead, offer up a nip of blueberry wine, pat me on the head, tura lura lura, hush now, don't you cry. So, thank you. Okay, um, all right, I'll do two more Catholic ones and then I'll end with my ever-present bitterness, but I think a little bit of humor. <laughs> Okay, reckoning St. Paul. In all the churches of the saints, women shall keep silent, subordinate. It is shameful for a woman to speak in church or outside church. And if a man wears a gown of vibrant colors and holds a golden chalice aloft and God originates within him, then by all means, hand your child over to that man. Don't fret, don't picture him donning his white robe, cinching his penitence belt, if your child is lighting the candle of the Lord and that man puts the candle out, then the candle is out. Be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, wives be subject to your husbands, for the husband is the head of the wife, as, child is, as Christ is the head of the church, his body. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and the priest loved me. While my mother covered her head, fiddled with her flower, prayed to be cleansed by the word so that I might be presented without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. The mystery is a profound one. How you let it go on so long. And then this one is confessional. Another place where um, a lot of bad stuff happened. Confes confessional. I slipped in between the folds and sat in the dark, hot box, examining my conscience and waiting for the screen to slide open and the keeper of the keys to materialize. His was not the face of a stocking-faced burglar or a postman or the creeper who used to circle my block in his white van, but it was not the face of God either. God would not have fingered a clump of pellets while peppering me with allegations he would not have said, are you sure that's all you've done? When I was little, I saw a supposed saint. She was the marquee attraction in the basement of a famous church. In her glass coffin, she lay with her hands pointing towards heaven, rosary beads coiled around her waxy fingertips. It was chilly in that temperature controlled room. According to the sign, she'd been lying unmolested for hundreds of years. Good for her. One touch and I turned right to dust. Okay. Um, and then, I'll, okay, then I got two bitchy ones. <laughs> Cause you know what? Like they can't take us down, right? Okay. So the little match girl, <laughs> I hope you guys are all right. I can't see you. So I'm like, I hope no one's like, oh my God, what's going on? Okay, the little match girl. A single match isn't worth shit and she knows it. Is everyone really ignoring her or is she just feeling sorry for herself? You can't tell me she goes unnoticed, a girl on the boulevard half dressed. Someone out here is into that kind of thing. But what advice do we have for her ladies? What about fair trade and quiet acquiescence? 
Think Cinderella, Snow White, or any number of dolls who held their wares aloft like flaming cakes. Call it a modern day fairy tale. A girl on a street corner, a couple of matches to her name, a holy host of magazines plying her with pithy asides and makeup application tricks. You too can have this couch, this fire, this tree, this man. All you have to do is freeze. Um, okay. And then the last one is uh, Lake Erie 2020. I have not aged well. My attitude all ire and Asland brows. I've let life seep in like bunkum. It's not pretty, but the stew has congealed, crusted to the pot. Everyone I've ever loved had courage, face straight into the storm, even the one in the mirror. Life takes its toll. We eat and drink and can't quite believe humanity's chance rants. Why not smoke? Why not stay up all night clinging to your closest friends, be they human or be they cheesecake? Now outside my window, poor old Lake Erie, that sad humpbacked stepsister is putting on quite a show. The sun is setting. We're living through a pandemic. And isn't she rich, consorting with this prize sky? sending up this chorus call just for me and whoever is zooming past in that ramshackle motorboat, we're still here. That's it. <laughs> um, I think that's good. <laughs> Thank you so much.